Good afternoon, everybody. I was going to do these in a bubble, and I was just going to go through this and dissect it into various segments and, and cut a bunch of videos out of it. And I still will, uh, but rather than do this in a bubble, I said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a Twitch-only stream today. And if you're watching this on YouTube after the fact, this is why you need to subscribe in both places, because sometimes I do stuff on Twitch, which it always shows up on YouTube. But... Every once in a while I sneak on here and we're going to do stuff like this. So, at the GDC, Game Developers Conference this year, um, Joe Bylos, the creative director of Funcom, sat down and did a, a pretty in-depth interview with WCCF Tech. So there's an article here by Kai Tetsumoto and Alicio Palumbo. And I know it's been making the rounds. They linked this in the Dune Awakening Discord. I want to say like three... When was this published? The... 27th what is today 29th yeah like a couple days ago whenever it just first popped up but i haven't covered it until today because i've been busy i'm on solo homestead duty right now guys because chris is up in the city with her family helping out with some stuff so um if i randomly disappear it's because i gotta go take care of chickens or cats or something so i haven't had a ton of time to do all the things i want to do but we're going to go through this today if you've got questions feel free to ask um i have been following this game for i, I Really, I think since it was announced, which I feel like that was something like three years ago, but I can't. I would honestly have to go back and check my channel because I did put videos up like when it first got announced. And it's funny because I actually have an episode of Mondays and M, uh, the uh, Mondays and MMORPG podcast I used to do. There's an episode on that show, and this is probably eight, seven or eight years ago now, where I specifically said that I hate PvP, but that a dune mmo would be the only thing that would ever get me into pvp because it's dune and i love dune and then years after i made that <laughs> statement funcom comes along and puts out you know a dune mmo that has crafting survival elements and also pvp and i just went shit i'm gonna have to go learn how to play pvp aren't i because i have been a care bear up until this point and i still prefer to play care bear and hopefully i'll have lots of care bear options um it sounds like it's going to be a, a wild ride no matter how it turns out in terms of PvE versus PvP. All right. So, GDC just happened. And if you weren't paying attention, uh, Funcom's uh, marketing team, the, the Dune Awakening people, were all off doing GDC and PAX and everything else. There was a 30-minute presentation given um, and a 30-minute Q&A, I think, at PAX. And then, there was, of course, there was stuff at GDC. Um. There is another article which um, we could look at another time because there's lots of great stuff here to, to carve out. So if you guys want this, this is the previous article. Um, this is also on the 27th. Um, Dune Awakening will be released when it's ready as Funcom wants to reduce its famous jank. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll dive into... Don't worry. There's going to be lots of Dune Awakening here on the channel. Um, I've already been covering this a couple times a week. Um, I will probably keep it at like two or three times a week until we have some sort of confirmed timeline on like an early access or, or launch. I generally don't go like, look at, you know, the most recently would be Dragon's Dogma 2. You know, I kind of left it alone doing like once or twice a week up until about two weeks before it went live. And then I ramped up. Same thing with Starfield and Phantom Liberty and Rogue Trader. I think the exception would be Baldur's Gate 3 because we had access to the early access we were actually playing for two, three months before the launch. So, you know, just as as, as they ramp up and get closer to the launch of Dune Awakening, I'll be ramping up as well because definitely going to be playing this um, with a group from our community um, are coming over from the World of Warcraft side of things. We're currently playing in Shrouded together on Saturdays and Sundays, and we're going to be moving over from Enshrouded to this when that when that happens. Um, so this article in particular that we're going through today, this is called uh, Creative Director Clarified MMO Size Hints at Beyond Arrakis. And this is from a roundtable Q&A with Joel Bylos um, and a lot of questions about the game. So we're going to go through these and take a peek. The first one says, do you have to be a female character to play a Bene Gesserit? So if you're not familiar with the books, 
the Benny Gesserit. Um, and if you've seen the films, great. If you've seen the films, you kind of know a basic. But for those who haven't, um, the Benny Gesserit are just a group of powerful religious figures in the Dune universe. It's all women, and they have control of a special tone of voice that they can use, which compels people to do things. Um, and so it's sort of a mystical, magical uh, organization, but it's also rooted in science a little bit. So um, so for many people, they were wondering when they saw the Bene Gesserit as a playable class during character creation, do we have to be a female character to play a Bene Gesserit? And the answer here is no. It says the, the idea is that you aren't becoming a member of the Bene Gesserit. You've just been trained by the people who know how to train in the ways of the Bene Gesserit. There's a couple of examples of this in the books and, of course, in the movie as well, when Paul is obviously trained by his mother. We have these examples of men picking up some of the traits as well, as long as they don't become official Bene Gesserit. That's how we're playing into the game as well. Um, I wonder how much these guys are mining the um, expanded universe that uh, um, his son, uh, Brian, has been out writing with um, Kevin J. Anderson for the last, I don't feel like it's been 20 years they've been working on those books. I know there's a lot of stuff there that people really love. I, I read the first few they published years ago. I think maybe the first four or five. They were they were fun, um, but I never like got super super deep into it. And I wonder how much. I wonder if they're even touching those, or if they're only focused on the first book. Um, I know Brian is super super active on on Facebook um, in terms of so is Kevin J Anderson um, on but Twitter as well, but X now. Uh, those, both those guys are pretty active and, and they've been promoting the hell of things so I know they're both very pleased with the, the film adaptations um, and these guys have been working with the film crew so visually at the very least on a style level uh, we should be getting pretty close to what we're seeing on screen recently next question there's the idea among some gamers that Dune Awakening will just be a regular survival game rather than a survival MMO Okay, you claimed the latter from the beginning, and the Steam page even mentions thousands of players at the same time, but that's since been removed from the Steam page. Can you clarify how the servers work and how many players will be online for a server at any one time? Oh, so this is going to be something that... Okay, yeah, there are people... Because this... I don't know if they're going to answer it here, but I know, for example, we've had the question of, is it going to be like Conan Exiles, where you can set up private servers? Um, or is it going to be more akin to uh i believe the most recent interpretation that i heard and it it sounded based on what i've seen so far um like it might be the case but i don't know yet because we haven't we haven't actually seen this publicized um or, or is it going to be more like destiny 2 where you have a central hub and then you're going off on missions doing it beyond that um i'm not sure what exactly we're going to see here um let's see what he says it, uh just it's different maps the reason we removed thousands of players at one time was that our organ optimization was not saying 1,000 at the same time. So we're like, okay, that's misleading. It's hundreds at the very best, and right now I would say so. Okay. Uh, he goes on to say there's a forthcoming blog that the marketing team is going to put out, which explains things with diagrams. But from a technical overview standpoint, it says here there's multiple maps in the game. Uh, survival map, deep desert map, and social hubs. These are all separate maps running their own Unreal server, and they all have different amounts of players per server. Social map, social map might have 200 players. The Deep Desert might have 500 players. The survival map might have 50 to 100 players, depending on how optimized it is and how many buildings there are. So this sounds like, just based on what they're reading here, and I may be extrapolating my own interpretation here, but it sounds to me like we're going to have a central hub like Destiny, and then a Deep Desert map, which is going to be PvP, and that's the constantly changing. Every week it gets wiped and it's new. And then he says the survival map, which sounds like it's going to be, that's the PVE map where you're going to go and build your permanent base and you're going to harvest and you're going to do the PVE content and you're going to go raid bases and follow the storyline and do the RPG. That sounds to me like that, that's what they're ex expressing right here, which honestly is really good because it does separate the PVP from the PVE. Um, if that is the case, because that's kind of the way, like, if I remember correctly, what is that game? Um, it's a stylized game. Song of Albion, Sword of Albion, something Albion, Albion Online. 
maybe what it's called. I remember that one. I tried it. I did a first impressions like last year, and it, that that one had very separate PVE versus PVP zones. Um, and then um, what other game am I thinking of did it that way? Well, it'll come to me later. Um, so that's what that sounds like to me. I have no idea if that's the case. Um, okay. They said we have multiple of each of these maps on the same world. So we've got, yeah, you're different instancing. Um, the difference between us and a normal survival game is that most other survival games have a single map and they stay in that map. Our game has many, many maps and many, many players across all those maps, including shared things like the exchange. The deep desert is always a shared location. In the game, it's nine times the size of the Conan Exiles map. So for those of you who are intimately familiar with Conan Exiles, I'm not. I played it a little bit last year, um, had fun, but I don't. I don't have any frame of reference for how big the Conan Exiles map is. So I'm sure that that's impressive, but it means nothing to me who hasn't had a lot of because I haven't had a lot of hands-on time with Conan Exiles. Um, I, I just started getting into crafting survival games like within the last year, um, and it mostly, especially recently, like the last three months or so. Um, while there may be 10 instanced survival maps, everyone shares a single deep desert map, so you'll meet people from all the other maps in that location. This is just a quick overview. Okay. So that's the technical drop down. So the next question is, how do you travel between the maps? Um, and the answer here is it's not menu driven. I don't know if anyone remembers how it used to work in Age of Conan. You have, but I, I don't. By the way, I have no friend. I, I never tried Age of Conan because I was too busy with. God, I want to say I was busy with Vanguard Saga of Heroes. Maybe EverQuest Two. It was around that timeline, I think. Um. Anyway, I remember it coming out, but I, I never played it. Um. Excuse me. Um. Who remembers how it used to work in Age of Conan? You have the world map, and you pick which area you want to go to. Imagine it like that, except that it's actually much more engaging traversal than it was in the old game. You don't click a button; you actually fly there. So that's going to be what an ornithopter ride, which is going to be really cool. Um. By the way, the 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 flying thing. I know they've touted like um, aerial combat, and we've seen some footage of aerial combat in. The, the preview trailers from the Dune Direct event. Um, and that same footage has been shared throughout the GDC stuff and the PAX uh, presentations. Uh, but we have seen some aerial footage, but what I don't know is how much of that is pre-rendered uh, you know, cutscene versus that's an actual dogfight happening with a player-controlled vehicle and a player-controlled ground vehicle. Um, I don't know how all that works yet. So, um, But the footage has looked great regardless. I don't care if it's cutscenes or not. It still looks cool as hell. Plus, you've also got um, those little speeders, man. The little tricycle speeders with the treads on them. There's, there's several mount, uh, several mounts in the game. It looks really, really cool. Several vehicles. Um, next question is, what's the difference between Deep Desert versus Survival? As far as I understand this, and I'm a, I will go through the answer here in a minute, but um, basically... You know, the deep desert is where you go for the spice blows and the PvP and trying to get the best resources as quickly as possible. And the survival map is more like you could run around with a couple of your friends, by yourself, whatever. Uh, but let's see what they say here. Um, Joel says um, they all have the same mechanics in terms of the maps. He says if you think of the planet's map, there's this thing called the shield wall, which is a range of mountains. On the outside of that wall is what they call the deep desert. The inside is where the people build because it's safe. Um, safe for the sandstorms, which are blunted by the mountains, and I think that means also means safe from the sandworms, too. Uh, the game is divided into two major sections, the inside and outside of the shield wall. Deep Desert is a full PvP location, completely seamless, all connected. There's nine Conan Exile-sized maps connected by server meshing into one area. There's no trigger here, there's no instantine. In that area, the sands will shift when the Coriolis storms happen and completely wipe and change that entire map at least once a week. Hold on, let me go back and read something here. There's nine... So does that mean that there's nine maps that are going to cycle... Th that it's going to pull from? Like, and cycle through? Okay. So, so the whole world changes outside of the shield wall. Inside of the shield wall is where you build your safe space. Uh, oh, perfect! 
they just answered the question I had. We're trying to build a game that has dynamic PvP areas and safe PvE areas where people can build their base. That is really comforting to know. And for someone who is a Care Bear like myself, that is a very good step towards confirming that, you know, it's we're going to separate all this stuff out so that you have the option to play how you want. That's very, very key. New World did it really well. New World did a really good job of separating PvE from PvP. Um, I could participate in PvP if I wanted to, but otherwise I could just run around and play like a normal PvE experience and go craft and harvest and have fun with friends and do dungeons and stuff. And if I want to on a Saturday afternoon, I can join the PvP war effort, you know? So it's it's really cool to hear that and see that uh, in, in writing here. Is the deep desert a procedurally generated no man's land? Uh, it says it's procedurally generated with a rule set. There are specific logistics that here that play here, which we want because the deep desert is where the big spice harvest happens, and this is where the big events happen. We expect the guilds to be fighting over resources. One of the lines we have about Dune Awakening is that it's not about kicking down other people's sandcastles. So many of the survival games out there right now are just about killing someone else's base when they're offline and then destroying their fun. Our game, on the other hand, is about actually sending people out to fight over resources at specific locations. Bases are shielded. You can't really destroy other people's bases, especially in the PvE area. They're safe. And then we send you out to the deep desert where you can engage in chaos and fight over the big resource areas. So that just confirms all of that, which is freaking amazing. So um, one of the things I can say that we've been, we've been really enjoying with the um, private server that we're doing with Enshrouded is just the ability for all of us to hop on and work on little projects related to building and harvesting and, and exploration and everything else. And then coming together, you know, a couple times a week to then go do the, the group based stuff. By the way, the patch that came out the other day, we're going to have fun. That's tomorrow, tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow and Sunday, we'll be streaming those sessions at noon. So, uh, and I'll multi-stream those. So those will be on YouTube as well. Um, I can't wait. So this kind of stuff sounds great, um, because it's separated out. Um, so we can just say, hey, you know, throughout the week, we can all be doing our own little solo adventures in Dune Awakening. And then on the weekend, you know, get together on Saturdays and Sundays like we already do and go forth and and wreak havoc and participate in the spice blows and see if we can't get resources back. That'll be fun. Um, what's the next question here? When it comes to your base building and the limited space within the area, how are you going to deal with that when you have a large number of players? Is it going to be capped per server? Uh, these are all great, great questions, by the way, like server related stuff, which is awesome. There's one version of the deep desert, but in the survival map, we can instance it. So there will always be enough space. Okay. And this also just goes to confirm that it's going to be always online servers. It doesn't sound like they're going to provide um, private servers like they do in in uh, Conan Exiles. I'm not seeing mention of that anywhere here. So it sounds like it's going to be an always online traditional MMO. You're logging into Dune Awakening and playing within that space, which is great. That's fine. Um, the next question, I understand the focus is mostly on PvP and Dune Awakening, but see, that's not, that's not the intention I've heard. I think that's just a part of the gameplay. Um, is there any sort of content for groups of PvE players like Dungeons or Raids? He says, the Ecology Labs are our dungeons, and I would strongly argue that it's all just PvP. Thank you, Joel. That's great to hear, because as someone who comes from the Care Bear background, you know, I've, uh, everything I've been reading and hearing about and seeing in the Discord has led me to believe that's gonna, that there's going to be a pretty, you know, a balance of kind of just do what you want to do, and you'll be able to pick and choose whether or not you want to do PvE today or PvP. Um, that question sounded like... Um, previous understanding was it's going to be all pvp and i know that that's not been something that i've found to be true i know that was my perception when it first came out and that was something i was very nervous about but as i've come to know more about the game i've realized that that's not something i really need to worry about it's, it's especially after reading this interview it's definitely more stuff that's going to be optional um uh joel goes on to say the end game has a strong PvP focus, with, which is going to be the spice blows and everything else. But he says, PvP is something I like to define in a slightly different way from just players killing players. It's actually about giving players common things they need and then having them compete with each other uh, towards that. Uh, okay, he says, their political system 
for example, is about encouraging players to compete towards specific goals and not necessarily just about killing each other. I would say the game has a player competition focus, but not necessarily a just kill each other, stomp on the corpse kind of focus. That's something we'd like to avoid, which is also why we're talking about this not knocking down people's sandcastle thing. It's also important that people know inside the shield wall you can build a base, keep it forever, and not be worried about it. Um, I want to chime in here because I know I got to go see where it's it's... It might have been the Dune Direct event where they where they sat down with Joel and, and did the presentation at the beginning. That might be where I'm thinking about it from. Um, but there was a discussion around the the, the major houses and the lands rat and, and, and how that's going to tie into the end game focus for the game where it's like he said competition here. So if, if anybody out there hasn't played it yet, I would I would urge you to go out and play Dune Spice Wars, which Funcom released I think it was last year. It's a RTS. They call it like a four times RTS, which I always get confused what that means. Um, but it was a I, I did some episodes here on the channel i live streamed a few times i played through one of the campaigns it was a great a great game i did end up enjoying it more on the pc than on the xbox because i did try both versions because it was on game pass it's a great game and the way that they did the lance rat in that game sounds like the way they're going to be doing it in dune awakening and again this is me extrapolating my own interpretation based on what i'm reading here but um the way i understood the the way this is going to work is there will be missions so again i go back to the way new world does it it's, this sounds very similar to new world where there are the missions that you can go get for each one of the factions and then those missions are to do these things and those things are things that are meant to be done with your guild it's like go be the first to the spice blow go gather you know go take over this base go gather these five things do this thing over here and remember there's events we heard um uh, multiple people have talked about since the conference circuit last week. They've all been talking about in their reveals and everything else about um, world events are also going to be a thing. I believe world events were even a part of the presentation, if I'm not mistaken, um, just to preview that. Um, so it sounds to me like it's more along the lines of, um, I guess, maybe what you would see in a traditional like arena based PVP uh, environment where there's an objective whether and it's it's not a simple objective like capture the flag it's a who can be the first to get 5000 spice back to their faction house and they're the winner so it's literally going to be guilds going out and trying to compete at who can get the spice the fastest and that means you know competing for spice blows and trying to raid someone else's um harvester and take it over or shoot their ornithopters out of the sky like they actually described in the um, I was think it was Force, the Force Gaming one we we watched the other day, describing them watching towards the end of that presentation a a um, spice blow in action and somebody up with the ornithopter, you know, keeping an eye out for you know other people coming in, other forces, and then seeing the sandstorm on the horizon and then that coming to envelop the group. Like it sounds to me like, you know, it, by the way, sandstorms also played a huge factor in, in Dune Spice Wars. Like that's a really good game. Um, if you haven't played it, I, I should I should probably go back and redo that at, at some point this summer and try the second campaign because there's like four or five different modes and I only fully did one of them. Um, it was a fun little game. Uh, anyway, let's move on. Um, anyway, it sounds to me, yeah, the the PvP is not about just like killing the other player and dancing on their corpses. I'm really glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear him say he, you know, they're trying to stay away from that and they want it to be more about just competition friendly competition with a little bit of you know and there of course there's going to be griefers but hopefully they've designed their system in a way where that will be kept to a minimum um are you going to be able to learn how to sandwalk and he says i've had this conversation a few times already which is why it's kind of funny yes eventually but your character won't know how to do it right away that's something i didn't know i didn't know that you would be able to sandwalk huh so unless you happen to be a duke with a hologram book that teaches you, <laughs> which is great. That was one of the cool things about going back and, and we just did the um, last year I was doing the um, Decoding Dune podcast while also watching the first film. And um, one of the things I remember being very similar is the scene where Paul is reading up and, you know, he's, seeing, he's, he's watching the hologram vids and everything else. And then in the film when they have the Muad'Dib mouse 
in there and he sort of pauses and he looks at it. It's just, it's a really cool way for them to learn. Uh, says, but even then you're not good at sand walking until you get to the second film and Shani shows you how. So he's referring to the films here. Okay. But the point is that we will have something when you get to the Fremen and start working with the Fremen and learning from them. But that's not what beginning happens at the beginning of the game. Which, by the way, I love the fact that they talked about um, recently um, the confirmation of cinematic cutscenes and story. So there is a deeply rich lore-based story here that you'll be going through as part of like your journey through the game. But remember, the end game ultimately is the PvP and the harvesting and the resources and the base building and the cosmetics and everything else. But there is a storyline here, which is... Um, I I know that... Um, anyway, I don't want to get sidetracked. I'll get back to that later. Um, and also, it's great to hear confirmation that we're going to be working with the Fremen in the storyline, which is really, really awesome. Um, he says, we also tried it at one point and it looked too ridiculous, too slow. Like you can sprint and run and you can walk and then you can sand walk and you kind of look like you're dancing and it's very slow. So of course we could fix that and try to design it in a better way, but for now it's not going to be there. Besides, you should only be able to sand walk once you get to the point where you're one with the desert. That's very true. Um, by the way, these are all screenshots from the presentation um, that was done and um, as I go through and dissect this and do individual videos in the coming week or two, um, I'll have these screenshots pulled out um, and we'll use those throughout. Um, but that's a long-term project. Um, uh, 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 i got to scroll back down and find where I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, next question. I know this is an MMO, MMO, but as a Dune lover who only likes to do PvE content, can I completely avoid PvP content? This is a good question because that's me. He says, absolutely, you can play the game without doing PvP. You don't have to care about it at all. Oh my god, Joel. Joel. Buddy, pal. You just made my heart swell with enjoyment and 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 a sense of relief at knowing that it's optional. Oh, Oh, I have not seen that confirmed anywhere until now. Like the fact that you can 100% just ignore PvP if you want to. You don't have to care about it at all. There's spaces in the game that are PvP marked and other areas like Guild Peace uh, marked as Guild Peace where there's no combat. All the social hubs are Guild Peace areas. Then you have areas that are like Partial warf Warfare and then the War of Assassins areas which are full PvP. So you have choices. And I'm sure it's going to be risk versus reward in terms of resources. So you're going to find the best resources and in-game stuff is always going to be in the more dangerous PvP areas. But um, it's still going to be great to know that you can just play PvE um, and, and have a great experience. Uh, he goes on to say, we break these spaces up and we tell people that they're enter when they're entering one, and so we let them know what kind of an area it is. I'm sure it'll be marked in the map too, um, if I had to guess. Um, and then of course someone asks about the writing of the Samworm. <laughs> he was like, yeah, I was waiting for that one. Uh, not for launch. He said, we will add it post-launch for sure. Ooh, confirmation of Sandworm writing. Uh, I don't know how much I need to explain it, but I want it to be meaningful. The movie did a good job, and so now I'm like, well, <laughs> now I have to do a really good job. It's complicated, it's an expensive feature, and we need to make it feel right for the game. I love the fact that they're not trying to rush that in for the launch, and they're going to worry about it later on. Next up, uh, the question is, can you carry enemy vehicles with the transport ornithopter? Um, I think I saw footage of that recently. He says, yes, actually, it's something that was kind of funny when we did our PvP tests. You just fly down and pick up someone else's sand crawler when they're in the middle of harvesting with the person inside. <laughs> the problem is that when you, get, when you get them back to your base, they're going to jump out of the vehicle and start shooting you. So there's always an interesting interplay, but yes, you can do that. Oh, wow. So there's lots of different ways <laughs> that you could potentially get someone's transporter. Uh, next big question the inevitable inevitable environmental fatigue there's not really much you can do while staying on arrakis but the dune lore is large and we do know that there are planets with different biomes we do briefly see them in the movies are you considering adding maps located on other planets post launch to provide some much needed biome variety that's a very good question because everybody's going to get tired of looking at sand all the time uh the answer is there's two points First, I think there's a misconception about the desert visuals of Dune caused by the movies. This is not how Hubert, Herbert, I don't know why I said Hubert. <laughs> That's not how Herbert described everything. In fact, I think Herbert was 
I'm thinking more southern Arizona style deserts with a few more plants. He talks about cigarette cactuses all the time. We have areas in the game that are much greener. And then there's the polar caps, which there are on Arrakis. Um, we've planted biomes for the game's post-launch. We have planned, sorry, we have planted these biomes for the game's post-launch, particularly the polar caps. So that's expansion content, DLC stuff. We do have a bit of, a bit of variety on Arrakis. Um, and when we start to run out of that, we'll start to look at other planets. We have mechanisms in place to enable that. I don't want to talk about it yet since it's so far out, but let me get the game finished first. Hopefully people are liking it and playing it, and then we can talk about other planets. Next question, do you have to use water in Dune Awakening apart for your own survival? The answer is yes. You need water for a lot of the industrial applications in the game as well, like refining resources. Oh. I did not know that. So it's not just about for your own... I guess that makes sense. You're going to need it for food production, potion production, whatever you're making. Um... It starts to put pressure on you across the board, but you also gain things like wind traps, which allow you to get passive water, and so it builds up over time. Dude, this the more I read about this, it sounds like they've taken a lot of the ideas, or there's a blending. I know Funcom published both of them. I keep coming back to Dune Spice Wars, and it sounds like they've got a lot of the same features. Um, this is how survival games work. You overcome a basic pressure, then you have a slightly higher version of the same pressure. It's not a cozy survival game. And I excuse me, don't think it could ever because it's Arrakis. Arrakis needs to be dangerous. But we did think, let's not make it a pain in the ass and a chore to play. We're trying to find the right balance, and I'm sure as we go forward with our betas, we're going to continue to hear from players about the right balance. Uh, does a sandstorm mean instant death? Not an instant death, yes, but it's pretty, pretty quick. You can survive for about 30 seconds after it hits. We do have a shelter mechanism, so you, don't, you can huddle up against a wall and hug the shelf in an overhang. You're probably okay with sandstorms in the first areas. Later on, the coral of storms will kill you and everything you built. So you get about 30 seconds to get to a safe spot. Otherwise, you're toast. Um, we saw a scene that was like that in... Um, I'm watching Three Body Problem right now on Netflix. And I, one of the episodes when they first are going into the VR and the sun comes up and everything burns and they got about 30 seconds to get the rock out cropping. God, I feel like there was a, one of the Riddick films did that too with the sun coming over the horizon and burning everything and he had to run ahead of it. I think that might've been the second Riddick movie. It's been a while. Um, if you're in the deep desert during the server wipe, do you see that happen? Uh, they say, uh, Joel says you'll get kicked out. You do get a warning. When we originally discussed the idea, I told the team it's like the Blood Moon and Zelda. You need to know it's coming for a long time so that you have plenty of time to get out of the way. Okay. So he says you get like a half a day of warning that this thing is building up. Coriolis Storm is coming and the sky starts to change. The next follow-up question to that is if you die in the sandstorm, are you able to go back to your corpse to collect resources? Um, all right. Now we're talking death penalties. All right. Different death penalties depending on how you die. The sandworm swallows you and everything you carry. So don't get eaten by the sandworm. If you're killed in combat, you first go down, but not out. Okay, so we've got like a... Um, if you're with friends, they can pick you up. If you have water, you can get yourself back up. But then if, if you die, you die. You'll drop resources. You'll just drop your spice. You drop harvesting resources. You drop currency, um, which you can bank. So you'll drop a lot of things. In Shroud, it's pretty lenient. You only drop like... Um, only resources. You don't drop gear. I don't. I don't see anything about gear here. I just see resources, which is good. It says there's different respawn points. We have three types of respawns. You have beacons that you can place out. You place one respawn beacon wherever you want. We then have a respawn at your base, and also a respawn at your last used vehicle. Then there's a checkpoint respawn when you enter an, an ecology lab. You get a save respawn point for just outside of there. So if you die in the ecology lab and want to recover your corpse, you can go back. You well drop resources, you can get them back from your corpse. In PvP, your corpses can be looted by other people. Uh, they don't say anything about gear. They just say resources. I'm okay with that. Um, I'm okay with it if it's just resources. If you die in a PvP area, can someone harvest your remains? The answer is absolutely. I know they've talked about before you need water, and you can harvest water from plants, other resources, and other bodies. So get ready. Um, 
You spoke about the ecology lab. I think in the lore, the goal is bringing paradise to the planet. Is that something we might see at some point in Dune Awakening where there's some eco um, ecology and environmental change? Um, I like the answer here. We have an alternate timeline for the movies and the books. We give a very clear understanding to everybody of why and how that came to be before we launch the game. There's a big story beat we have later in the year. Oh. Some of the ecology labs we've have had wind traps and have been collecting water for 10,000 years. The water's been leaking out. Some of the ecology labs you may have even seen in our art are just full of plant life. They're very vibrant and green. I sort of describe ecology labs a little bit as the vaults from Fallout because 10,000 years ago they sealed them off. Some have been found. Some have been used by the Fremen. Some of them have been found by other factions like bandits. In the first book, Leto says he wants these ecology labs because they're full of equipment and who knows what else. Maybe they were experimenting with the AI. Uh, even though it's completely illegal. Uh, maybe they had an AI that were, they were secretly tinkling with and it's been left alone for 10,000 years. What does that cause? We have this idea that there are breaks from the normal experience in the rest of Dune Awakening, which gives you a feeling that there's more to this universe and there's something else going on. Um, interesting that they call the ecology labs like dungeons, by the way. Um, I'm sure they'll be instanced. Um, I wonder how big those will be and I wonder how many they'll launch with. Dungeons are always a priority for me. I like dungeons. I love dungeon runs with the guild. Can vehicles get stolen or destroyed? The answer is no. Right now in beta, we have a permission system. You can say this vehicle is only one that I can use, or this is a vehicle people in my guild can use. You can set permissions up. In terms of being destroyed, we have what we call a backup vehicle option, which means you can back up one vehicle so that if your vehicle gets destroyed and you're in a place it's hard to get back from, you can summon that vehicle and use it to get back. There are also ways of mitigating that. If you lose a vehicle and you're on a rock island with an NPC base, they'll have a vehicle you can steal, which won't last for very long. They're not very good, but you can steal something and try to get it back. Okay, so at least you'll have a backup vehicle. Um, <laughs> I love his answer to the next question. Can you share any details on the business model and monetization for Dune Awakening? And his answer is, well, it's an MMO, so we're going to keep it online and running, which means we're going to have to have some form of monetization post-launch. I don't think we're ready to talk about the details of that yet. People just need to get ready. It's a game as a, it's a game as a service. There will be ongoing costs, and if you want access to things, you'll have to pay for those. Whether those are DLCs, whether those are microtransactions, whether whether it's a monthly sub. Um, I I doubt it will be monthly sub. I, it'll probably be free to play with microtransactions, and then like box cost you know and, and dlcs but who knows it's gonna be interesting to see i'll be playing it regardless it doesn't matter to me um i'll be happy to play it um in the book children of dune leto 2 becomes a sandworm is there going to be something is that going to be later on the ski or something like that later on the ski i don't know that phrase um there's a main story in the game that the player follows i think and Jill says, I think it's an interesting backbone to the story and it draws upon more things from Dune Messiah than it does from the original stories. But there were some mechanics to it that were interesting. You cannot cover yourself in sand trap and become a sandworm in the game. That's definitely not part of the plan. He says he did once want to make it so that when the players take spice in the game, they take it without wanting to because it's in the air as well. But if you go to a spice bow and you don't have gear, your spice bar goes up, increasing your addiction. The higher the amount in your bloodstream, the more things you'll see. One of the things we talked about originally was just making mental trips in which they could just turn into a sandworm and roam around the map, but we said not to do that. That would have been trippy. <laughs> um, so, I love the next answer too. Great. Uh, can we expect the full launch of Dune Awakening before the end of the year? Um, Joel says it's the best question. I would love to know. I don't know. We don't want to ship it till it's ready. I don't know how many of you have played Conan, X Conan XLs. We have a reputation for interesting ideas and some jank. I would prefer to get rid of the jank. I'd like to launch a game that's really polished from Funcom. We've grown as a company. I think we can deliver a polished survival experience. It's a big IP. It's really hot right now. We took the IP in 2019. We knew there'd be a film. Um, we didn't know what it was going to be for the films that they are right now. Um, it's blown up into something gigantic. There's more pressure on us, and obviously we feel that pressure, so I want to make sure the game we fill can fulfill the fantasies of Dune fans. So that was the roundtable part. Um, there's another section to this, because at the beginning we got told that the, um, there was some other stuff in a different article. How much of this is... Some of this is going to be the same. I'm going through this really quick. Otherwise, I may just link this. Okay, so this is um, 
This is by Lesio uh, Palumi. Um, they add credit on the other article as well. Um, this one is more of a look at the game as opposed to an interview. Dune Awakening will be released when it's ready as Funcom wants to reduce its famous jinx. We kind of ended the previous piece on that note. Um, I'm going to go through this here really quick. It says here, the GDC 2024 presentation started with the very beginning of the game, highly reminiscent of the first Dune movie. Um, you first customize your characters. Oh, so this is the presentation stuff we heard about. We watched when we watched uh, Force Gaming's YouTube video of the day for that first uh, look at things. I did the reaction video to that. That's basically what they're talking about here is that presentation they saw. Um, you start off customizing your character's look, picking their background, including what planet they're from. Then you're making choices that uh, influence your dialogue trait, which I it sounded like um, I don't know how much we're going to see. And Is it going to be a, uh, a Bethesda-style extra line of dialogue, or is it going to be something more like Pillars of Eternity, where it's way more in-depth and has a, a Baldur's Gate 3 version, you know, where it's like it's it's a really deep narrative structure that comes about because of you having this special uh, dialogue option. I don't know how that's going to play out yet, but apparently you get something that's more... If it's the former, it's going to be just for flavor. I'm okay with that, but you know, I'll be interested to find out if that's just for flavor or if it's actually something more meaningful. Um, after that, your ship gets um, shot down. You then have to survive. You start off at a cave, um, and the typical survival stuff happens. You make knife, you make a knife and a heal kit, harvest some plant fiber, get into the free climbing system. There's suspensor belts, the sugar wire grappling hook. Um, you don't have to worry about the open sand. You might get eaten by a sun sandworm. You might get sunstroke. You gotta wa get water. Um, oh wow! Um, it says here, um, Joel Bylas warned people not to ingest too much plant fiber in the process of drinking water from plants because otherwise there might be drawbacks. That's very interesting. I didn't I didn't know that. You can harvest metal. You can use your cutter to identify structural weak points. That sounded really interesting. The way you draw lines on things, um, which is cool. Once you have a suspensor belt, you can glide from high points and preserve momentum for higher jumps. There's the free climbing system. There's also combat. It says the presentation showed two types of characters, troopers and mentats. Trooper used a spring-powered pistol, the sugar wire grappling hook, and the standard grenade, while the mentat was a human with computer-like abilities who identified human information at range thanks to the battlefield calculation skill. You can also use a hunter seeker drone, which we've seen footage of because everything was like yellow highlighted. Was cool stuff. Um, the hunter seekers can only see enemies that are moving, so stationary enemies are invisible. Same tactics can be employed in PvP. Water is critical in the game. You can harvest it from enemies' blood or refine it using a water purifier, which gives you a massive buff to your health, but only in certain situations. Just depends. Um, so this is a, an extensive building system, which we've known about for a while. We've seen plenty of screenshots of the building system. I can't wait. That's one of the things we're most excited about, I think, is being able to customize our base and our guild home. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then, of course, personal homes. Um, you're going to activate a hologram of any structure you see. I, I saw this in the other um, video we covered, and it sounded really interesting where you can look at a, a another building in the environment and make a hologram of that structure that you're interested in building and then put that back at your base so you can find inspiration in the environment and then build that yourself and add to it so it's kind of like kit bashing in a way because you'll be making your own blueprint along the way it's pretty impressive um it says um there's the okay yeah there's the blueprint system to copy and rebuild structures for survival in the coriolis storms where things get wiped out once a week Bases have different crafting machines, such as the blood purifier. You can spend points in a technology menu to buy schematics. Cool. Vehicles are game of, vehicles in the game are made up of different components. You can customize them with various elements. A sand bike might have a faster engine, as an example, or more efficient engine, or a seat in the back. It says here, Joel also stressed the importance of discovering unique schematics in the world, which can be sold to other players at a high price. You're also going to see damaged spaceships to go get. Yeah, we heard about the we heard about those falling from the sky. The events. Then there's the nighttime when the Sardaukar come. 
They're looking for escaped prisoners, which you happen to be one of, which is awesome. Sardik are creepy, man. I remember when I first read the book years ago, and when they first got to the, the explanation of the Sardik planet, it was creepy. And then Denise Films portrayed Sardik, you know, it's just the planet they're from, really, really well done. Um, there's also the Sandworm to contend with. It says the MMO portion of the game connects servers with social spaces like villages. Excuse me. Um, I need another cup of coffee. That's where you're going to find trainers, merchants, guilds, and factions. That sounds an awful lot like the Destiny system. I keep hitting my desk with my knee. I'm sitting down in my draft chair today, and I'm in a weird position. Um, you can also take skills from a variety of trees, from Benny Jesuit all the way to Planetologist. There are three active abilities, three passive techniques. It says these are particularly important when exploring the ecology labs with the dungeons. Because they're going to have unique experiments and challenges. Spice is obviously the game's backbone. Players are going to need it for various activities, and you're going to get it by harvesting in the desert. You can work together to gather spice using transport orthopters and sand crawlers. And I remember, I think it was the Force Gaming video we reacted to, he talked about, um, I guess one of the things they saw at GDC or at the PAX was um, the... Um, you have to craft all your own vehicles. You have to craft an ornithopter. You have to craft other things. So it's good to hear about um, vehicle crafting. That, that's a cool thing. Um, I'm tempted to move a sand crawler. Draws the sandworm out. Spice will be violet when it blows up in the air before turning orange brown as it oxidizes. It says Funcom got the green light from the Herberts to make this visual change which is really cool yeah see this screenshot i saw earlier they're carrying a transport here in the um in the ornithopter that's a special uh transport ornithopter this this i mean all of this looks incredible to me um i'm very excited to get into this game i can get up from my chair now now that i'm done with the reading portion um i've been i've been following this game since it was first announced um it's been a pretty cool journey to see it unfold. Um, I've, 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 I've followed a lot of video games over the years, everybody. Um, I'm a, I'm a middle-aged white guy. I've been playing games for a long time. I don't get hyped over games anymore. I do get interested in games. Um, you know, when something piques my interest, I get focused on it. Um, this game, because I love the, the books so much, um, I'm, I'm, I'm hyped because it's a Dune game. I could care less at the end of the day, and, and this is no disrespect intended to, to Funcom whatsoever. I could care less who's the developer of Dune as an MMO. I love Dune. So it doesn't matter to me who's the developer, who's the publisher, any of it doesn't matter to me. I just need to know that the Dune IP is in good hands and that the people who are in charge of it respect the Dune books and the Dune lore and are in that space and everything i have seen from the funcom team has made me feel like they are the right people for the job um i've been in the discord since it was first announced and the team has always been there super super helpful always answering questions that's not something you see from developers all the time so it's really nice to see they have a you know they're there in Discord all the time. And yeah, there may have been media silence in terms of not having a ton of information out over the past few years because they've been busy building the game. Um, I like the fact that there's at least an interaction with the fan base. And there's a lot, like, there's so much that happens that goes on in the Discord where I'll, like, come back after taking a nap or I'll go work for a few hours, do a stream, and I come back, and there's, like, 400 answers, or 400 comments, excuse me, in the in the general section of discord and you're going through there and you're just like there's 10 15 people from the dev team dropping in there and asking you know answering questions and talking about various things expanding upon things that we've seen in videos and interviews that we've read and without giving you know they're not spilling all the beans but they're definitely you know there's been a i i haven't seen a lot of developers share this much passion for a project in a long time and i was i was telling somebody the other day um it has definitely built my interest in the game more than just because it was a Dune MMO. I was going to play it anyway because it's a Dune. I've I've been talking about a Dune MMO for like 20 years, waiting for somebody to come along and do to and do one. And so it's been very refreshing to see it done. And I was nervous at the beginning. 
Um, I'm less nervous now. I'm, st I'm still not hype hyped, but I'm, I'm the hype is building. Um, it looks really, really good so far. Um, some of that is just Unreal 5 is a really, really, really good engine to build on because of everything they've done with getting rid of LODs and having all of the lighting and shading technology, which basically eliminates a lot of the work that had to be done by hand or, you know, in terms of having uh, a graphics engineer a graphics programmer um, taking care of all that and, and doing custom shaders and all this crazy stuff with lighting. It just does all that stuff, nat you know, natively now. And obviously there are things you can do to that to make that better. But um, Unreal 5 is a really cool engine. The game looks amazing. The team seems really passionate. Um, I love the fact that in the interview they brought up um, – the other books, um, Doom Messiah and Children of Dune, and Joel had an answer right away, referencing the Sand Trout and other things. So it's it shows a deep appreciation for the books and the lore that's there, um, and that's something that um, at the end of the day, as long as the people behind it love what they're working on, it's going to show up in the work. So I'm excited. I can't wait. Um, anyway, I'm going to go through these articles in the coming week or two and start to pull out sections and dissect them and talk about various things um, in greater detail as I continue to educate myself on everything coming out about this game. And if you want to follow along for that journey, hopefully they've inspired you to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon so that you never miss an update. I stream every single day between here and on Twitch. Uh, actually, today we're Twitch only. Usually I'm multi-stream. I forgot I was Twitch only right now. Um, usually I'm multi-stream on YouTube and Twitch. Today I happen to be Twitch only because every once in a while I sneak on because we're, you know, I've been YouTube, full-time YouTube for three years and I've been actively working on growing the Twitch in 2024 now that we got multi-streaming added to the schedule. So um, occasionally you'll see me do stuff only on Twitch like this, but we are taking this over to YouTube after the fact. Just follow in both places. It's the easiest thing to do. There's a Discord, a Patreon as well. Hopefully we'll see you there. And hopefully you'll join the Dune Awakening Discord. Just ping me when you're in there and say, hey man, and I'll, I'll ping you back. It's a cool place to be. There's lots of stuff going on. Check out all the socials, and I will hopefully see all of you on Arrakis soon. We're going to be having fun. Um, our community is ready to go. It's looking good. Can't wait. Let's go, sleepers. See you next time, everybody. Have a great day.